Well, good morning and welcome to another teaching. It's a Thursday morning here in Texas and uh, we say it every time. Hopefully y'all are just loving on Jesus and walking with Jesus. There is, uh, there is nothing in our lives that's a greater privilege and of greater benefit than just spending time with Jesus, growing to love him, growing to walk with him, um, growing to experience his love and growing to obey him and growing to repent when we fall short. All of these things are just our amazing privileges. So we just worship you and we thank you today, Lord Jesus. We just thank you for your mercy and favor and goodness on our lives. We thank you for your word. We just thank you for your mercy and goodness, Lord Jesus. Father, we just love you today and we thank you. We thank you, Father, just for uh, for loving us and redeeming us and uh, just sending Jesus to die for us um, and pay the penalty for our sins. Holy Spirit, we ask you to lead us and guide us now as we open your word. We ask that you give us eyes that see and ears that hear in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus. All right. So... Um, the last couple of months, the last three or four months of, uh, I don't know what it was, golly, I don't even know what I'm saying, but from sometime August of last year up until like um, end of November, we uh, we taught through the first eight chapters of John. I don't know if it's 45, 46 teachings um, that covered the first eight chapters verse by verse by verse. And so today we're going to pick that back up and we're going to start in chapter nine. Um, just an incredible chapter, 40 verses of just, uh, 41 verses of just, uh, just this incredible, the entire chapter is works around Jesus healing a man that was born blind and all that just goes on in the situation and just all that happens with the religious leaders. And it's just, it's just an incredible teaching. I think uh, I think we're going to come away from this just, as always, just really being overwhelmed with Christ and just learning the principles of what it means to follow Him. So um, today we're gonna. I don't know how far we'll get. We may only get through verse five, um, maybe through uh, maybe through verse eight. I'm not sure. So I'm going to go ahead and read it, and then we will just get rolling. Chapter 9 of the Gospel of John, verse 1. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Verse 3, neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. As long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Verse 6, having said this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Verse 7, go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means sent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We'll stop there at verse seven. Um, it's the end of chapter eight. There's this, the, some scholars just see this interesting principle here. Charles Spurgeon saw this interesting principle of just the ease of movement and the complete peace that Jesus had you know, even in the face of of his of people trying to take his life, you just see Jesus just just so cool, you know, and it's just a uh, it's just exciting to see Jesus move. When chapter eight ends, right? And remember when the scriptures were, you know, when the book was written by John, he didn't put chapters in there. Um, so there's just the flow, right? Um in chapter 8, verse 58 and 59, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. 
He claimed to be God when he said that. Verse 59 says, at this, they picked up stones to stone him. But Jesus hid himself, slipping away from the temple grounds. The other translations, a couple other translations say that he just passed by, just passed by and there was nothing they can do. Now, verse one of chapter nine says, as he went along and the other versions, the other translations say, you know, um, as he passed by a blind man, this version says, as he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. And so there's this principle, and again, uh, this is not something I had seen. It's something that, uh, you know, when you're studying the scriptures, you know, we want to look in it, we want to study it. But as Bible teachers, it's important that we study the scriptures, glean from it what the Spirit of God is showing us and teaching us. And then we want to look and see what other responsible, um, you know, men and women have said about this passage. We want to see what other scholars have said about the passage and insights that they have that the Spirit of God, you know, hasn't given you. And so when you're preparing to teach, we want to, we want to use all that's at our disposal. And, you know, they pick up on a, uh, on this principle here of just the, uh, the, the, just the, the complete peace of mind and the ease of movement at which Jesus handles himself and manages himself. Even in the face of verse 59, they they pick up stones to go to stone him and kill him, but he just passes by and passes through them and nothing happens. Nothing happens because it wasn't his time to die, so he willed it not to happen. Jesus is God. We don't know how it happened, but, you know, he just very easily could have changed their mind. They pick up stones to stone him, but then they said, you know, in their own minds, something to the effect, yeah, I guess we don't want to do this because he impressed on them that, no, this isn't going to happen. Um, and so you see this, this incredible peace that Jesus has, you know, regardless of the situation. It's a picture for us, an incredible picture for us as believers in Jesus Christ and, and children of our God and Father of how we want to live this life. Really, for all of us as Christians, our circumstances really, really do, regrettably, dictate our level of peace. And although we can say it's understandable and like I want to say it's understandable, it, it doesn't have to be that way. The scripture teaches we can be at peace and not have any anxiety, even in the midst of the most trying and difficult circumstances, as we see here for Jesus that, you know, he didn't just have peace when everything was was calm. He had peace in the face of, of people trying to kill him. And he just had an ease about his step, Corinne, right? He had a, a coolness about him. And, and, I, and, I, and I confess that I, I certainly enjoy this kind of peace when my circumstances, the, the things in my life, um, line up in a way that I like them to, to line up. But when my circumstances are uh, when I perceive them to be unenjoyable, difficult, imposing, frustrating, scary, I don't I don't have the same ease. But as we walk with Jesus, as we as we labor to grow in our relationship with Jesus, this 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 character trait of Jesus Christ will increasingly become more and more ours. Now, in, in my life, I've been walking with Jesus around 24 years um, in an intentional fashion. And certainly, I believe I'm substantially better at this, meaning dealing with difficult circumstances with a with a more Christ-centered focus. But by no means am I anything like this where 
where trying times or difficult times, let alone life-threatening times, come, as is the case for Jesus. And, and my peace is no different as if I'm watching my beloved Dallas Cowboys play football. And of course, they have to be winning because if they're not winning, I don't have any peace, regrettably. That's a whole other issue. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, you know, when I'm watching the Cowboys win on Sunday, I mean, the world is right. Right. When everybody's healthy. Um, my wife, my children, and, and all those in the ministry. And, and just when just when everything is in that place, I mean, there's just this beautiful peace, Scott, right? But then there's there's issues with work. There's issues with family. You know, there's just disagreements. There's all kinds of problems in the, in the ministry and in the church sometimes that we have to deal with. And it, and it, and it shakes our, our comfort. It shakes the ease. And we become frustrated and irritated and irritable and everything else. Not Jesus. And so I'll say again, as we grow to mature in our relationship with Jesus, we'll have this ease for which we pass through situations without getting just massively anxious, without getting worried, without being concerned. We'll, we'll commit the situation unto him and we'll grow to be more and more peaceful, even in the face of things that we didn't think it was possible to have peace in. But Lord Jesus, we, we, we need a lot of help in this, Lord. I need a lot of help in just growing and maturing and just having a, a, a steadfast peace that you are indeed in control and that uh, you are the Lord of my life. You're the Lord of our life, Lord, and that, um, and that you've got it handled. So, Father, we do ask you to help us to, to emulate our Lord Jesus in this. Holy Spirit, lead us and guide us that we might have this this quality of ease. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Verse one, as he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. Verse two, his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? The disciples, it's just a very interesting statement. If you really Listen to the verse again. They say to Jesus, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? So if he was born blind, blind at birth, what sin could he have possibly committed? So they have this errant theology, right? They have this idea that they had gotten somewhere in the culture that somehow the man, how the man, how could the man have sinned? He wasn't even born. So clearly there was nothing he could have done, right? And I guess maybe they say, maybe if he didn't do it, what did his parents do? So that they had this theology that because his parents might have had some, some terrible or wicked sin in their life, that God struck the child this man with blindness, and he came out of the womb blind. Now, there are going to be several incredible principles we're going to learn from this. And, you know, the, the really the most important is going to be how Jesus responds to their question. But we often can have judgments about why difficulty is happening in someone's life. Okay. Now, there are there are various reasons that that we come as believers in Jesus Christ, as children of our Heavenly Father. There are various reasons why difficulty or hardship comes into our lives. Okay? And Jesus is going to explain one of them here. Now, there are times when we behave sinfully that that does cause consequence in our lives. When we behave in ways that are just... Uh, you know, that go against the word of God and the will of God, as clearly outlined in the scriptures, the word of God, there are always going to be negative consequences that, that, you know, that happen because of that. If, you know, if, you know, and, and it can be whatever it is, right? It's, it's the same with, you know, if we break the law and just blow through a stop sign and blow through a red light, there are ultimately going to be negative consequences when you're pulled over, right? And you get a ticket. And, and that's 
and that's not fun. So there are just natural cause and effect consequences that come with, you know, with with ungodly behavior. If 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 people are consistently living in a sexually immoral way that goes against the scripture and they get, you know, a disease from that, you know, clear they they were living in a sinful way and the consequences come about physical consequence that, you know, that now they have a a, a, a a sexually transmitted disease and they have to go to the doctor and get the uh, the prescription or, or whatever it is to get that healed. If, if someone smokes their whole life, smokes cigarettes, and, you know, and we know that cigarette smoking does cause cancer, and oftentimes people get away with it, which is great, but, and then all of a sudden our lungs are filled with cancer, you know, that, that's a direct cause and effect relationship that we knew happens when you smoke cigarettes. So there are physical consequences from, from sinful behavior. Now, but there are also spiritual consequences. And that's kind of what the, the disciples are, you know, are thinking about here, that they believe that, you know, somehow this man, although he'd never been born, something he did, how could you do anything when you hadn't been born, you know, caused him to be born blind. Um, there were some people that thought it, you know, they believed in reincarnation. They, they might have heard that maybe he did something in a past existence. None of that's true. Um, or they thought that his parents might have done something wrong. Now, again, none of these are things biblically as to why someone is born blind. Again, there are spiritual consequences to uh, to our actions. Our Heavenly Father does discipline us, as is very clear in the scriptures. Um, Hebrews 12 makes it very clear, right, that uh, we're to endure hardship as discipline, that our Heavenly Father is treating us as sons and daughters. Um, and so sometimes when, you know, when we disobey the Lord, you know, we will come on hardship and difficulty um, in this life, you know, whether it be, you know, physically or emotionally um, and it could be financially. And it is discipline but from our Heavenly Father. But something like this, something like a, a, when a child is born blind or has a birth defect, um, scripturally, Theologically, this comes from just just a, a sinful, fallen world that we live in. We live in a corrupted world, and because we live in, live in a corrupted world, we have things like birth defects, like someone being born blind. We have natural disasters, right? We have tornadoes. We have horrible things that happen, and these things happen because humanity— our great, great, great times, whatever, grandparents, Adam and Eve, right? And, you know, they're a picture what they did when they sinned in disobeying the Lord and eating from the tree that he commanded them not to eat. Uh, we would have done the same thing, right? Everyone in history would have done what they did, except Jesus, who did not do it. And again, that's a whole other, other teaching. But they're a representation of what all human beings would have done. When they sinned, they, they brought sin into the world, and that sin corrupted everything in every way. It brought death into the world. That's why a beautiful, gorgeous flower dies, right? It dies because there is corruption and, and death in the world, right? It just, you know, it just wilts and dies. It's a horrible thing, right? You see this incredible, beautiful, stunning, say, don't you love those? I think they're lilies, right? With the big yellow cup. Um, right, Leah? Lilies. Um, and, and and it dies. What is How long do they last? A week? Um, I'm not a florist. But uh, in heaven, those lilies won't die. Because there'll be no sin. And so, you know, just accidents, right? Again, the Lord is aware of them. The Lord could have, he has the power, you know, to intervene and, and could have caused this man not to be born blind. And oftentimes he does. And we're often and generally not aware of it when he does. But because of sin in the world, um, 
uh, not only human beings, but everything has this corruption of sin. The ground cries out, you know, and is looking for its liberation, Romans 8 says, um, from sin, from corruption of sin. It's in everything. Animals die because of sin. All death comes into our lives and is in our lives in every form of death, whether it be our death or the death of, again, of, of flowers, the death of animals, the death of a, of a beautiful bumblebee, right? All because, you know, we live in a corrupted, sinful world. Um, and so the disciples have this misconception and, and the answer Jesus gives really is, is pretty exciting, you know, and it's a lesson for us. It's a, it's a major lesson for us in the church today. And it's a, and it's an in-house, it's an in-house thing, right? So they, they ask him a theological question, but Jesus isn't going to give him, Jesus isn't going to give them the theology as to why this man was the way he was. Jesus doesn't give them a, uh, a theological answer as to why this happened. And we're going to get into that. Verse 3. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. So he, he simply tells them that, that their presupposition is wrong. It wasn't this man or his parents that sinned, that why this is like this. This happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. And that work was, was, was going to happen here within the next few minutes where we see down um, in verse six, where he says, having said this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the, with the saliva and put it on the man's eyes. Verse seven, go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means set. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. Jesus, Jesus doesn't get into a theological or doctrinal um, you know, discussion with them as to how this happened. We, we live in a church culture, and particularly those of us, and, and I'm certainly guilty of this, where we are obsessed more with doctrine than we are with Christ. And it's true, right? And the more obsessed we are with doctrine, it's, you can almost be certain the less you are with Christ. Now, be careful, right? Paul told Timothy to, to watch your life in doctrine carefully or closely, right? Doctrine is extremely important, okay? But doctrine, and we ought to do all we can to have proper biblical theology and doctrine. But it should not be ahead of our desire to know Christ, to love him, and to walk in the love of Christ. It's interesting that, that the disciples don't do anything to help the man, but they do want to have a theological discussion about why this man has been born blind. It would have been more important for them to look to serve the blind man, to be a blessing to the blind man, to love on the blind man, than to worry about what sin put the blind man in this place. And again, this is this we, we have to have an important balance here, okay? We're certainly not saying by any means that just living in a sinful lifestyle is not something that we shouldn't address, obviously first in our own lives and then in the lives of others. 
But there ought to be a loving heart in a situation for someone who's hurting, someone who's in trouble, someone who's struggling. Even if they have sinned, there ought to be a compassion and a mercy in our heart to be a blessing. I'm not saying we enable them, okay? So I said this is a very, very fine line. And we cannot say enough about this because I don't believe there's ever been a time, you know, uh, you know, since, you know, the Reformation, since we've come to really understand the scriptures and to really know, you know, over the last, say, 400 years, right, four or 500 years, um, that, that the Bible is the living word of God, which it's always been. But there was a time in history, you know, where it was just very dark. You know, um, where where very few people understood the scriptures and the plain meaning of the scriptures, and you know th- there there was this time along the you know where where in the, in the late fifteen hundreds and the sixteen hundreds where the revelation of the scriptures, beginning with salvation coming by grace alone through faith alone in Christ alone. Um. And Martin Luther was a huge part of that. And there were men before him where, you know, we had the revelation that the Bible is clear that nothing we do can save us. We're saved by God's grace through putting our faith and trust and reliance and confidence in Jesus alone through clinging to Jesus Christ for the salvation of our soul and the forgiveness of our sins. Um, That's the only way we're saved. There is no works based salvation. Um, Uh, there's nothing we can do to take away our sin. Our good works don't take away our bad. We need a savior. We're hopeless. We're desperate. We're helpless. We need to run to the foot of the cross. We need to humble ourselves before Jesus and, and out of that heart, call on him and ask him to save us and to be the Lord of our life. You know, proclaiming to him, Lord Jesus, I believe you are the son of God. I believe you You came into this world and lived a perfect life for me and died a perfect death for me. And I believe you are alive and risen today. And therefore, Lord Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart now and be the Lord of my life and to save me from my sin and to bring me to heaven when I die. Jesus, I place all my faith and hope and trust and confidence in you alone to save me and to be my everlasting Lord and God. Remember, it's not the words that save us. You just don't say a, say a prayer to God and just think that just saying those words save you. But it's posturing yourself before him. It's understanding and agreeing with the word of God that you are a sinful person and you are desperate and hopeless and headed to hell. And only in Jesus Christ, only Jesus can intercept you as you're falling into hell and pick you up in his arms and bring you out of that hell and into eternal life in him. John 1, 12. To all who received him, Christ, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become, to be children of God. It's only in Jesus Christ that God the Father becomes our heavenly Father. So since this time when we had a proper, you know, sound understanding of the scriptures, um, as I as I said earlier, we've gone through the centuries and we were really at a time now where we have more concern and care and desire. And again, generally the people that are like this, they, they, they don't see it. They certainly won't admit it. And as I've said, I, I can fall into this, okay? Because doctrine is important. But you notice Jesus doesn't straighten out their doctrine here, okay? And, you know, it's, it's imperative that our desire for Christ and our love for Christ be running out ahead of our doctrine. And no, they're not one and the same. Yes, they are, you know, they are very much a part of one another, and they are in certain ways two sides of the same coin. But there is a clear imbalance, and I'll say particularly for those who have a zeal and a passion for doctrine, right? Anyone who has eyes that see, anyone that's a that's a, a devout believer in Jesus Christ has seen this and can see that there are people, there are Christians 
that have very little understanding of in-depth doctrine of, you know, they understand the essentials of Christianity, but they're not getting into deep theological debates about original sin. They're not getting into deep, massive debates about, about, uh, about predestination and election. Um, and, you know, they have, yet they have just a, 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 a far more loving and pure and devoted and servant's hearts and servant hearts than a, a vast majority of people who do have this passion to know all of the doctrines of scripture. It is a reality. Those of us, certainly I'm one who has a passion for doctrine and to study the scriptures. And you, if you're going to be a Bible teacher, you certainly need to have that. And again, every Christian should have a desire to know doctrine, but you should, ahead of that, ought to be a desire to know Christ and to love Christ. And we need to repent, okay? Particularly those of us who, 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 you know, who walk around with our Bibles and, you know, we are, we are so zealous about doctrine. We are the doctrine police. And, and yet you can, you often see very little love for Christ come out of this. And again, these people that do this, and again, there, there, there are, there are various denominations in the church today where this is an issue. And then there's the imbalance on the other side. There are countless denominations where they don't care at all for it. Okay. It's our job. Those of us who do believe we're called and we're going to be judged more strictly, right? That's what James told us. Now, many of you should presume to be teachers because, you know, myself as a teacher and all others are going to be judged more strictly by the Lord because, you know, we ought to have a passion to teach it correctly. We ought to have, it ought to be essential in our hearts to teach it. But more than that ought to be that we are going to love people in Christ. I'm not talking about a just a gooey kind of emotional love. I'm talking about an agape love that these disciples didn't have for this man. They, again, were more concerned. Rabbi, who sinned? There's a man born blind. Why don't you bless him? Why don't you give him a sandwich? Why don't you give him some food? But you know what, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents? Now, again, there's nothing wrong with asking theological questions, but let's do that as after we love people and serve them and bless them and have compassion and mercy on them. And Father, I ask you to forgive me where I have fallen short in this. Forgive us as a church. Those of us, Father, who, who are teachers and who do teach the word of God and preach the word of God, where we have fallen short an elevated doctrine over Christ. Lord, I, we know that they are they are very much entwined, but I ask you to forgive us, Father, we, where we have failed in this, Lord. And I ask you to give us, Holy Spirit, eyes that see where we have fallen short in this and ears that hear and hearts that we could earnestly repent. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Verse three, neither this man nor his parents sin, said Jesus, but this happens so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. So he does now, it's not because of any sin, but this actually happened, he said, this malady, this incredible difficulty of being blind at birth happened so that for this very moment, Jesus is going to go on to heal him here right away in the, in the next minutes. He's going to heal him of his blindness. And he's going to use this interesting method of doing it. And we'll, we'll get into that the next time. Um, we'll probably get through verse 5 today. Um, but this happened that the work of God might be displayed in his life. This is a reality. Whatever difficulties or hardships or overwhelming circumstances, and some can be just, there, are, there can be no words sometimes for how hard things can get right? Just bad things can happen to us. People can die in our lives, loved ones, horrible sicknesses and diseases, a child being born with a birth defect. And then obviously the day-to-day -day difficulties that we go to, which are not compared to that. And as a side note, we have a tendency, 
forgive me, Lord, as I do, to complain about day-to-day difficulties that are not like being blind from birth, right? I've said before, I have a brother, Abraham, who's a quadriplegic, and he complains more than almost anyone, less than anyone I know. He's a quadriplegic. He can't move any of his four limbs. You know, it's generally those of us who have everything that complain the most, Lord. And again, I'm, I'm sorry, Lord. It's just, there's just so much that needs to be fixed, Lord Jesus. And I ask you to help us with that, Lord. I ask you to, to convict us of that. And I pray we could do it in joy. We know we're not condemned, Lord. We know there's no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. We know you're not just the Father pointing out how sinful we are. But Lord, help us to just to just to repent, Lord, out of joy that we might know you better and love you more and love your people more. This happened that the work of God might be displayed in his life. Whatever you're going through today, whatever difficulty you're going through, has happened so that the work of God the Father in and through Jesus Christ, facilitated by the Holy Spirit, that work would be displayed in your life. Really, every difficulty that you have is an opportunity. Every hardship, whether it be financial, physical, right? It's a physical sickness, um, mental, emotional, um, relational. We have a lot of relational hardships, right? All of these are so that the work of God might be displayed in your life. When, when, a, when a hardship comes into your life, when a difficulty comes into your life, if an accident happens, whatever it is, again, whether it's spiritually, physically, emotionally, financially, relationally, Melanie, whatever it is, it, it happens, either God caused it, which he, he can cause it, or he has allowed it. Okay, um, you know, sometimes God actually disciplines us and, and brings about a difficult situation in our life. And it would seem more often than not that he, he, he allows these difficulties in our lives. But either way, as Jerry Bridges says, it has at least his passive approval. So if a difficulty is in your life, he's certainly aware of it. He could have prevented it so that it never happened. He chose not to prevent it. So it has at least his passive approval. Does that make sense? That makes sense, Stephen? Um, meaning he didn't necessarily cause it, but by the very fact that he knew what was going to happen and he allowed it to come to pass, meaning it has at least his passive approval, right? Look for where, if you look back in your life as a believer in Jesus Christ, you can see the Lord working in your life through difficulties. The famous scripture we quote all the time that God works all things for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. If you're in Christ today, he is, he is absolutely wanting to work everything for good. And the more you love Christ, the more you walk with Christ, the more you'll experience this principle of him working all things for good, uh, even very difficult things, right? And especially those, you know, <laughs> good circumstances, well, we know those are working for good. We like them. We feel good when things are good, right? But he's working the good circumstances in our life and the, the ones that are, that are hard and difficult and terrible. He's working those for our good too. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, okay, said Jesus. Um, but this happens so that the work of God might be displayed in his life, right? So he does give them, uh, you know, a, a kind of a, 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 a small theology here, okay? He doesn't go into the, the depth right? Of, of original sin. He doesn't explain the error of, of their thinking theologically, but he simply tells them that, that this man was allowed to be born blind. God almost certainly didn't cause him to be born blind. Although he does tell Moses, remember in Exodus, where he tells Moses who makes man blind. So again, that's a, that's a separate situation. And basically that's saying God didn't cause this man to be born blind, but since he could have stopped it and he didn't, how different are they at some level, right? So this man's being born blind did have God's passive approval. Um, but it happens so that, that God would be glorified in Jesus Christ right now. Jesus is going to go on to heal him, okay? And again, this is what the Lord wants to do in our lives. And we need to emulate Jesus Christ in this, okay? We need to have, as I've said already, um, we need to be diligent in being more loving and more compassionate and more merciful, more giving. Um, 
as well as holding to good, sound biblical theology and doctrine. But again, your love for Christ ought to be out ahead of everything else. And there is no doubt that those of us who have the greatest passion for doctrine are almost never the most loving. Those of us who have the most right doctrine, it's apparent, are rarely the most loving. And that's an imbalance. And we're going to be accountable to that. that. Do we get that? As pastors and preachers, right, who again believe we're the custodians of the Bible, we're the ones that have all the right doctrine, and again, we should, we are going to be the most responsible for being the most loving. So in the fear of God, we need to repent. Forgive us, Lord, golly, forgive me. Mm. Verse four, as long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Okay. Now you notice Jesus, the work that Jesus was sent to do, what he's about to do here wasn't, again, to bring them theology, but it was to have mercy on the man, to heal the man, to have compassion on the man. And you have to do this while you're alive. As long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. Jesus, you know, while he's alive, he's he's walking to the cross where he'll, he'll be killed. So we have the opportunity. Obviously, Jesus is saying, you know, As long as it's day, while he's alive, while he's in the world, you know, you do the work of your heavenly father. You and I today want to emulate Christ in this. As long as it is day, we must. We want to be like Jesus Christ and do the work of Jesus Christ. Do the work that Christ has given us to do, which is every believer in Jesus Christ is to is just to call is called to be working for Christ. I know that's a horrible word in the church today. Again, you're not saved by any work you do, but we are called as believers to work unto Christ. As long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. You and I need to do the work of Jesus Christ who sent us. The Father sent Jesus, Jesus is sending you and I, and while we're alive and we have breath in our lungs, we must do the work that Jesus Christ sent us to do because night is coming. When no one can work. That's the second part of the verse, right? Verse four, night is coming when no one can work. When you when we leave this life, when we die, there'll be no more time to work in this world, right? In the famous book Scrooge, right? When, uh, you know, when uh, when Marley's ghost appears, you know, he's, he's grieving. You remember in the book because he and the other dead spirits, right, that roam the earth, They have this longing to interfere for good, but they have no power to do so. Interfere for good today in every way the Bible lays out while you have the power to do so. Verse five, while I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. It's only in Jesus Christ that you have any light. It's only in Jesus Christ that we can do anything. Father, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for your mercy and goodness on our lives. We thank you for the holy scriptures. Father, we ask you to help us, Lord, to to bring forth love, the love of Christ first, and then bring our sound doctrine behind that. I pray, Father, that we would have a, a greater care and love and desire for Christ than we do Calvin. Father, I, uh, I ask you to help us to, uh, to, to walk this fine line, Lord, but to be led by the compassion of Christ and the mercy of Christ and the love of Christ, all the while standing on the living word of God. Lord Jesus, you are the light of the world, Lord. It's only in you that we can see anything, Lord. And Lord, I thank you that you live in us in this world by your Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, we ask you to go ahead of us today. We ask you to convict our hearts and help us to live in a way that we would do the work that you've given us to do while we can still do it. In Jesus' name.
Amen and amen.